out. But internally, the thing that I want to challenge you on is as you're stepping into this new world, uh, giving yourself permission to need to adapt to that new reality and understanding that college life is a weird and funhouse mirror version of reality. It, there, it is unlike anything that comes in your life before it. It is unlike anything that comes in your life after it. Definitely true. And, and so it requires a very unique set of survival skills that you really have to adapt on the fly. So the first thing I think Nick and I are trying to say to you is we want to normalize this experience. You are not the only one going through it. Secondly, we want to encourage you there is almost always going to be school counselors that are available on your campus. There's almost always going to be therapists that are part of the staff. For free. To, if usually for free. It's usually a benefit of what you get there. And we want to encourage you to go talk to them because what you're going through is going to take some time. And I want you to have a reality check, an external voice that speaks to some of the experiences that you're having. I want to obviously encourage you to seek things like clubs. And my last piece of advice is also don't be afraid to have a conversation with your family physician physician with whoever your actual medical doctor is, describe some of these symptoms, they may say that they'd like to try you on a low-dose antidepressant. There are worse ways to deal with depression than to allow a, a, a good doctor to prescribe a low-dose sertraline or something to that effect. You know, steer clear of Xanax, but you know you might want to try something like, like a sertraline that, that might take the edge off of this and bring you to a place where you might feel a little balanced. And the reason I bring that up is because in this late teen, early 20 stage of life, uh, there's still a pubescent change that's happening in the body and in the mind. Uh, the, the human brain does not finish its development process until the mid-20s. And, you know, for most men, it's not until about their mid-60s. So, hey, now. <laughs> hi -oh. So, you know. Shots fired. <laughs> shots fired. So, you know, don't be afraid to allow a physician to prescribe something to you. Some medicine actually might be valuable here and, and might be warranted. Well, and one other thing to consider is that uh, – you know, it, this this is something to really kind of take a look at because at this age, this is where we do see um, mental health symptoms really yeah. kind of start to pop up. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where the age, which, you know, a lot of people get diagnosed for yes. the first time yes. for um, mood disorders. Yes. So that'd be this something This is the onset. Too. Yeah. Early 20s, Nick, is – you're right. That's whenever we see the majority of mental illness beginning to surface. So if you're out there beyond even this writer, if you're in college – um, really attend to your mental health, guys. And, and if you're seeing symptoms, log them, journal them, report them to a therapist, to your counselors, uh, to a physician, because if there are any mental illness symptoms, this is where we're going to discover them and we'd like to treat them early rather than let you suffer. Absolutely. Yeah, get on this right away. Yes. Yeah. Great question. Thank you so much for writing in. All right, Nick, our next one. Tips to help with Facebook addiction. Oh, ah, look at that. That's crazy. I totally was talking about that. Oh, I could have written this one. Tips to help with Facebook addiction. So basically, I'm a Facebook junkie and I want to cut down but can't stop completely because of work and personal reasons. How can I cut down? I'm pretty obsessed and I hate it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> can relate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is something I think a lot of us can relate yes. to. Yes. You know, and we were just talking earlier about, um, you know, the link between social media and depression and, yes. and how these two are, are very well uh, connected. You know, and the other thing, too, is I, I think one of the things that's interesting about when we talk about, like, social media addiction is – you really what we're kind of talking about is the neurotransmitter dopamine, yeah. is the, the feel-good neurotransmitter. And what we know is that we know that uh, research indicates that when we are talking, when we're in a conversation and we're talking about ourselves, there is a greater release of dopamine yeah. than when we're talking about a the other person or right. a neutral party or something else. Mm -hmm. In regular conversation – uh, talking about ourselves consists of, I can't remember the numbers exactly, so don't quote me, but it's somewhere like 10 to 20% of mm -hmm. regular conversation ha is self-focused. As opposed to social media, which right. is almost 80 to 90%. Right. Think about all the stuff that you post, right. all the stuff that you tweet about. It's almost always about 
us right. or it's it's our reaction to something that's in the news or mm-hmm. something that's happening. It's all like, hey, look at me. Yeah. Don't forget about Don't me. Don't forget about me. <laughs> yeah. And like so, we're all sitting around going, gosh, <laughs> right. what does Nick think about the Secretary yeah. of State stepping down? <laughs> like, the world needs to know. <laughs> yeah. In case anybody was wondering. In here's case anybody my was wondering. Um, but yeah, but that's the thing that makes it very addicting, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that release of dopamine. It's like, mm. I get to, I, and you have the other part of this too, is you have a guaranteed audience. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, it's right there and it's easy and it ex, it's so accessible. Yes. I think for me, Nick, the, so I, I think I struggle with this too. And I know for me personally, my version of this has actually been a mere reflection of what you just described. So I think for most people, it's the self-focus. It's me mm-hmm. put, putting out into the world about me. For me, I don't post very much about me, but I really like what's called lurking. So lurking is whenever you're <laughs> constantly renewing your feed and you're watching what other people are doing and you're joining you know, these, these threads of conversation and you're looking at the comments. And there's a meme of like Michael Jackson in the 80s eating popcorn and smiling, you know, like that's me. I'm that guy that's like, oh, what's going on today on Reddit? And and like I really struggle with it because it's this – it's almost like this rapid fire succession of topics. And I oh, think yeah. what this is – what's happened to me personally, speaking just for Jim, my attention span and my brain rate has moved into such a new place. Like I need new information quickly. I grow uh, impatient and, and really bored really fast and I've become dependent on this mechanism, this phone and it's many apps that move at lightning speed and have so much information to kind of keep me entertained. And so for me, yes. the reason I realize it's a problem is the same reason that anybody addicted to anything realizes something's a problem. Your wife yells at you. So <laughs> that happened to me. She's like, hey, would you put that thing away and like focus on us? And I'm like defensive. Like what are you talking about? It's not a big deal. You guys aren't talking so why can't I check it? And I realized, wow, if there is five seconds of silence, I feel the need to dive back into this machine yeah. and zone out and go into the trance. And that realization was like, man, I need to start putting some distance between me and my device. So I started plugging it in when I get home and making sure that that charging station is in another place. You know, yeah. it's on ring. I can hear it if the phone rings, but it's away from me. And I'm reassuring myself like, it's okay, Jim. It's okay. You're just charging your phone. You need to charge it. <laughs> and like, yeah. but that was enough for me to like break away. And I would promise myself I'm not going to, you know, look at it until my kids are in bed. And, and that way I can kind of focus on my family. Yeah. And what you're really referring to here is dependence. And yes. how do we know when we're dependent on something? You take it away. Right. And you see what happens. Right. So <clears throat> in, in uh, you know, addictions treatment, we talk about the biopsychosocial model of addiction. Right. Uh, so if we're talking about biology, um, you take it away and how does your body respond biologically? Yeah. So like with alcohol, okay, yeah. you're going to start to experience withdrawal symptoms right. if your body is dependent on it. Yeah. Um, psychological, what do you experience when you take it away yeah. psychologically? Well, we start to experience cravings, yeah. rapid thoughts. And my, you I do. I do. Like my craving would be yeah. boredom. You know, that's, and, that's how my craving manifests. And preoccupation. Yes. Right. Yeah. Agitated, want to know what's going on, feel like I'm out of the loop. Wondering yeah. if something big's happened in the world and I don't know. Right. Yeah. And social would be um, how does your social life – Yeah. How is that affected when you take it away? The person – the writer said that, said, you know, I, I kind of can't cut it out completely because of work and personal reasons. That's a good point, Nick, because actually now Facebook and social media, you, it might be irresponsible to just destroy it and throw it away completely because you actually do need it to some extent – uh, sure. To interact with some of the people that matter. I have cousins who I only know when they have a because, child yeah. because it's on Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. No, that's yeah. true. That's yeah. true. That's really important. Yeah. Like, Whenever I know. go home for Christmas, there's always like a few new babies around. Right. I'm like, who's this? Who's this? are these? I don't... <laughs> you have to go back to Facebook really quick and figure out who belongs to who and like sit there holding it up next to the kid's face and match them up. Yeah. Positively ID them. But you know, it's true, Nick, because like if, if we didn't use social media, the world would be deprived of uh, our podcast and, and being updated as far as when we're doing that. tragedy. Tra- we can't allow that. You know, right. so we definitely have to negotiate this space that the social media technology shouldn't be abandoned and discarded completely. 
completely like one might discard heroin and they can just go absent for the rest of their lives. But negotiating how I allow this to, to have an intersection with my story to the place where I'm not, as Nick said, dependent on it or it's not having an outsized influence on my mind, my brain real estate, my hours of the day. So speaking right. only for myself, one way that I addressed this was I divorced myself of the object. So social media exists inside of my personal phone. I would make that object go to a timeout. And so it would – that object was not in my possession for periods of time in my evening and that allowed me to begin to start tiptoeing away. Right. And it was an odd and, and weird situation, man, and, and it's something I had to train myself to do. And I had some family accountability because my wife was like, hey, you know, I need this thing to go away so you can focus on the kids. Even if you're just sitting on this couch and there is nothing going on and you're watching our daughter color, that is called being a father. Yeah, being just present. do that. Just be present. And I right. had to relearn how to do that mentally, how to be present. So here's my idea. And I, I, this is not an original idea, but I'm going to take credit for it. Most of your ideas aren't. <clears throat> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> Sad how true that is. Um all of these things are available on a computer. Mm, mm -hmm. They don't have to be accessed uh, on your phone. Yeah. Delete it from your phone. Yeah. That's what I would challenge you yeah. to do. If Good you point. you and this is one of the things that we talk about, you mm -hmm. know, in addiction is if you want to distance yourself, then it's up to you to create as many roadblocks as you can between you yes. and that thing. Good point. Make it difficult for yep. you to access it. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, you're saying that you need to have this for work and personal reasons. So if it's for work, make it accessible on a computer. Right. Delete it from your phone. And at least that way you have to get up. You have Good to advice. go to the computer. You have to log in. Yeah. You know. Put some roadblocks in there. You know, that's such a good point. And like ironically, that is something that I've done recently, um, specifically and only with Facebook. And I was telling you about this at lunch today that Facebook, the app, like installed three extra Facebooks or something <laughs> yeah, like right. these weird like sidecars into my phone. And my phone was like moving really slow. And, and I'd read something online said, hey, if you delete this, watch what happens. So I deleted Facebook. And all of a sudden I had like a new phone. And I was like, whoa. And I was so resentful that I was like, I'm not reinstalling it. You know, <laughs> screw you, Facebook. So I haven't done it out of spite. But it's there if I want it at a computer. And so I will mm -hmm. check it occasionally, see what's going on with my family. But I don't use it as much. Now I just need to get rid of the other 99 social media things I'm addicted to. But one one step at a time, right, Nick? Progress, not perfection. Progress, not perfection. So, yes. But um, good for you for at least recognizing that it's a problem and wanting to do something about it. Yeah. Um, and unless you, know, you do something about it, it's going to get worse, not better. Yeah, and you know, one last note on this, Nick. Um, if if you're addicted to something, okay, like Facebook, uh, there's an approach to this called harm reduction, right? And so, if you can't quit it completely, here's what I need you to do: I need you to go to facebook.com/podtherapy, and I need you to share everything we have. Okay, <laughs> you comment on every single episode, and just review the pod. <laughs> I need you to share it with all of your friends. I need you to private message all of your friends and share the pod <laughs> and tell them, "Hey, man, I really think this apply to your life." Let's harness that addiction for good. <laughs> if we can't beat it, let's at least put it to use. For the global wellness. The word – I think the phrase you're looking for is exploit it. Yeah. I mean, you know, tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you for writing in. That was yes. a really good question. Thank you. So. All right. Our next one uh, has to do with communication in relationships. Lately, my boyfriend and I have been fighting more often than not because I have really terrible communication skills. What are some tips for improving communication in relationships? Sign language. That helps. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> I'm going to challenge you on that. Yeah. And one of the things that she talks about here is that, I mean, she personally admits I have really terrible communication skills. Right. So uh, I actually do a group, a gr you know, group therapy process on communication skills. And mm. one of the things that we really try to focus on is looking at how predictable communication actually is. Yes. And let me provide you an example. Um I'm sure everybody, every one of our listeners can think of two people they know that always seem to get into arguments. Right. And you can imagine what one person says. And before person B has a chance to respond, yes. you know what they're going to say. You know what they're going to say. And then before A can respond to person B, you know exactly how A is. Yep. It's a dance. Mm. And it's just like a waltz. And every step is very, very, very predictable. Mm. And these people aren't special. Mm -hmm. You do that too. Mm. I do that too. 
we are all very predictable in our communication. So when we get into an argument um, or you know a heated discussion, the other person already knows for the most part what how we're going to respond to something. They are preparing themselves. Mm. One of the best things to do is to be unpredictable. Yes. Right? And to change it up, to kind of – so keep them on their toes a little bit. Yes. You know? The other thing that I really like to focus on too – uh, when having a communicate or having a discussion about communication, um, you know, dialogue is very important. 